For anyone working in sustainability, I, I, I think the job is always quite challenging. I mean, this is a very new addition to the world of business. There's no blueprint on how to do this kind of job well. We're figuring things out as we go. All of the sort of industry standards that we need to follow, those are being developed very, very rapidly because it's all so new. Um, so you really, really need to make sure that you can be reactive and proactive, flexible with, with your strategy. And I think it's, it's also really important sort of that you take the time to focus on, on your small successes as well. Because the goal of any sustainability program is to sort of future-proof your business against environmental change and to find ways that your company can contribute to making the world better somehow. And those are very sort of ambitious goals. So it's very important to sort of stay motivated and focus on the day-to-day -day and what you're achieving there because all of your small achievements will hopefully eventually add up to a bigger one in, in the end. But if it's, it's really important to sort of celebrate those smaller ones on the way. Welcome to the Sizing Podcast. My name is Michelle. I'm the Digital Marketing Manager of Middle East, Africa and Europe. And today we have a very special episode and you will learn today something about her, about her career path, about her vision, about her motivation, also as well what her key moments of the episodes are so far. And yeah, I'm so happy to be here today with you and welcome. Yeah, thanks. It's so nice to, to be here with you as well, Michelle, and have you join us for this episode. Yeah, finally I see you in person yes. because so far <laughs> we only saw us in teams and mm -hmm. it's so nice to be here together. Yes, definitely. So, Fazi, let's start, I would say. And first of all, I would like to know who are you, where are you from, where have you started your career, in which kind of areas did you start and what else you would like to share from your side? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So, I'm from the UK, I was born in London. Um, and until very recently lived, lived there as well. So, I mean, in terms of sort of where I started my career, academically, it was very, very different to, to what I'm doing now. I, at university, I studied politics and philosophy, and then I did a master's in geopolitics. And when I graduated, I didn't really have a clear sense of, of the sort of career that I wanted to have. I, I knew that I wanted to do something that would sort of benefit people around me, um, and given that I studied politics, trying to go into politics seemed like the obvious choice. Mm -hmm. So I gave it a try, but I um, didn't really enjoy it so much. So <laughs> decided decided to sort of um, switch tactics. So in, in the end, I thought, okay, well, why not try working in sustainability? Let's give that a go. I interned at various corporate sustainability consultancies in London um, before taking up what was now my previous role at a nonprofit there. So the nonprofit I used to work for is called the Fair Initiative. It's an investor network where institutional investors can sign up to become a member. And in return, they receive all of FAIR's ESG and sustainability research and engagements with sort of the global food industry on sort of specifically on protein production. So FAIR used to work with global food companies to identify ways that they could improve the sustainability of their protein production value chains and also bring investors into that conversation as well to find ways to sort of improve sustainability in a way that would work for businesses and also protect shareholder value um, and the investments in these companies. So I spent four years there or so before taking up my current role at Livonic Animal Nutrition, which was a really exciting move for me after working in consulting, after working with investors in the nonprofit world, this was sort of the final piece of the puzzle to, to come directly into the industry and, and start working with the great team here at Avonik. Good to listen to you and yeah, we are happy to have you and good to know that um, yeah, with the politics it did not work, that you uh, changed your path in a different direction and also that you took the time and to say, yes, I would like to do something different, I would like to channel my energy in something where I can add to the world and which is of course sustainability a very good area. And yeah, with that, I would want like to know was there any area or any specific incident or something where you feel like I need to change something. I mean especially the split 
from you, where you said the politics were not working for you, that you said, okay, I go in a different area. So was mm -hmm. there something which motivated you? Um, I, I don't think it was a specific event. Um, back when I was in school and deciding what to study at university, even after university, I was still really finding it hard to figure out well, what kind of path to follow. And looking back, I think the reason I found it so hard is because I really, this was my priority, being able to do something that would make the world better somehow. I was very lucky to have a good education and I really wanted to make sure that seeing as I had that privilege, that I, I sort of directed it towards something, something good. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it wasn't really a specific moment, but just a general feeling, mm -hmm. I think, that sort of grew over time, I think. It's so beautiful to listen to you that you really followed your feeling that you said you would like to do something to make the world a better place. And as you said, you, you have the privilege of a very good education that you really can channel your energy in something good, something created to make the world a better place. And really by selecting consciously the right career paths with you, as you said, I think this is really an impact we can do as individuals. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you're able to sort of spend some time really figuring out What, what you want to do with your career, it can be very, very impactful. Yeah. And it's so good if you take your time or if, we, if, or if we take our time to do that. And then, yeah, we will also follow our visions and our values. And this makes us happy and this makes also the industry happy because we add with energy our passion to that what we are doing. Yes, absolutely. Okay, and while I was listening to your career path, I would like to know, have there been any challenges or any obstacles which you overcome by following your, your values and your vision and yeah, adding and do something beautiful to this world? Yeah, I think so. I mean, for anyone working in sustainability, I, I, I think the job is always quite challenging. I mean, this is a very new addition to the world. If business, there's no blueprint on how to do this kind of job well. We're figuring things out as we go. All of the sort of industry standards that we need to follow, those are being developed very, very rapidly because it's all so new. Mm -hmm. um, so you really, really need to make sure that you can be reactive and proactive, flexible with, with your strategy. And I think it's, it's also really important sort of that you take the time to focus on, on your small successes as well. Because the goal of any sustainability program is to sort of future-proof your business against environmental change and to find ways that your company can contribute to making the world better somehow. And those, they're very sort of ambitious goals. So it's very important to sort of stay motivated and focus on the day-to-day -day and what you're achieving there because all of your small achievements will hopefully eventually add up to a bigger one in, in the end. But if it's, it's really important to sort of celebrate those smaller ones on the way. I can imagine and I think that's the reason why, you, why we are here and doing this podcast, you know, that you are really adding something from your knowledge, also from the industry, to include guest speakers as, especially as well. To, to share and to share expertises in this area. And I think, as you said, we, it requires flexibility. It's very important that really you, you ask yourself on a regular basis what I'm doing. Is it enough? Is it good enough to add something to uh, this area of sustainability? Mm -hmm. And by doing that, I think it gives always room to start to think out of the box, as we are doing currently with our new podcast. Really, we do something different in this industry. And this is, I think, a beautiful initiative to do something different and, yeah, think out of the box. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've had so much fun doing this podcast. We've had so many really, really interesting and inspiring guests, and I I've learned a lot from them um, in the time that, that I've been sort of doing this podcast, and I really hope that our listeners have as well. Yeah, and I think the beautiful thing is also our guest speakers, they can share the podcast, and so the networking is increasing, and this, of course, is increasing awareness in the sustainability area in the animal nutrition industry. Mm -hmm. And as you said, you enjoyed a lot with speaking to the guest speakers. I would like to know, um, yeah, what are your key moments? Were there some moments where we said, wow, I learned something new personal for me? And I think that's a very good start that we say, let's jump in the episodes and give you to know, um, yeah, what are the key moments? Yes, absolutely. In order to live, We all must eat. That's a fact. Protein 
is a very important part of the human diet. Also a fact. That's why protein needs to be accessible, affordable, and available to all 8 billion of us. This is a challenge. The greatest global challenge we face. Lives depend on it. But this global food challenge is not just about nutrition. It's about much more. Because how we source animal protein in particular has consequences. It impacts humanity, its health and well-being. It impacts animals in breeding and in the wild. Ultimately, it affects our entire planet. It affects life itself. That's why it's absolutely vital to act with exceptional care. And there is only one way to do this right. With science. Only evidence-based solutions and a common passion can establish a truly sustainable and secure food supply. That's why we're sciencing the Global Food Challenge. Because it's all about life. Welcome back to the Sciencing Podcast. Now, Fasi, we are going to the key moments of each episode, which have been recorded so far, where we will start with the episode one, where it was all about protein, protein production in the industry and why should we care? I think investors are excited about the uh, animal nutrition industry, right? Um, and they want to make sure they cover the risks, but they also want to be, you know, investing in in the solutions. Um, and, you know, we think that, you know, diversification into, you know, other proteins, non-animal protein is a great way to do that. We are excited about, you know, different ag tech opportunities. We're excited about innovation in feed and we're, you know, excited about innovation in ingredients and the implication and the, uh, and the, and the impact that looking at that industry can really have on the whole global supply chain. What do you see in the animal nutrition industry and the investors should do in order to reach the goals of the sustainability agenda of the industry? So I, I really enjoyed talking to Maria about this topic. I think looking at the investment perspective is really, really helpful to get sort of a broad overview on which sustainability issues are, are the most important, um, not just from sort of a pure environmental perspective, but also to, to our other stakeholders and um, business financial performance as, as a whole. And as Maria said, um, I think investors really understand the environmental challenges for the sectors that they invest in quite well now. And now sort of the landscape is evolving and investors are really looking for solutions to some of these challenges. So if you look at sort of the in investment world, there are more and more financial products coming onto the market that seek to sort of invest in companies that are really pr um, providing those solutions and giving a positive impact on, on the world. So I think what that means for the animal nutrition industry is that we really need to make sure that we're communicating the, the potential of our products to create this positive impact really well with, with the financial community there um, so that they really understand our business model, our products and how they work. And this, this can only benefit the, the industry in the long term. And I think this should also be sort of con considered in our value chain communication as well. Of course, our customers need to know sort of how our products can help them meet their sustainability goals, but also their customers as well. 
Um, I mean, we really, really need sort of full value chain alignment throughout the sector to make sure that these solutions are taken up by the rest of the value chain. And that's been that's a very, very common theme in, in sustainability in general. How do we sort of uh, coordinate, I guess, different actors in the value chain to work together towards common goals? And that's actually something I really, really enjoyed in, in episode five of the podcast as well. Thank you, Fadi, for the comments of the last episode. And now we're moving forward to episode five, where you had the chance to speak to three companies which have the same vision and goals in order to make more sustainable seafood. Also, Fadi, to uh, talk a little bit about the partnership and, and what makes it uh, successful, uh, you know, with, between the three companies that are here uh, together. Uh, I think there has to be an undeniable interest to do the right thing, uh, even if it's difficult. Uh, so if you're looking for the right partners, they will support your enterprise, they will support your goals, uh, and it could be complex uh, process, no doubt about it, but having the right partners that have the same interests, the same goals, will make everybody kind of lift uh, together in the process. What were your learnings? What did you learn from this episode? How to build a successful value chain partnership? So something I found really, really interesting from this episode and a really good takeaway for me was hearing Max talk about the reasons why this partnership between between all, all of the different stakeholders was successful. And the point he makes here about sort of the importance of selecting your partners well was really illuminating for me. I think in any multi-stakeholder partnership, there are always going to be challenges. There are going to be difficult points. And at the beginning, I think it's very tempting to, you know, when you're planning, think, oh, God, how can, how can I minimize the risk of any sort of disruption happening during the project? But Max's perspective here is very, very accepting of the fact there will always be challenges, no matter how well you plan your project. So instead, thinking about how can we make sure we're best placed to deal with those challenges when they come was a really, really interesting approach. And I think his point to that when you choose your partners for a project, you need to make sure that they share your vision and your mission and your passion for, for the topic is, is really, really important because then if difficulties do arise in the process, if you're all very sort of clear on the shared goal that you want to achieve, then it makes it much, much easier to sort of work towards your goal and figure out solutions as you go. Yeah, thank you. I think it's very important what you just said, that it's so important to keep the goal and the vision in mind, even there are coming obstacles or challenges, that you are, always have a drive where you want to go. And this is just reminding me on, on customer what we are also having, because also Evonik has this ambition to have close partnerships with our customers, where we all have the same goals and walking in the right direction. This is the fool, I would say, of, of success. So Fazi, we are heading to episode number four where it was all about how we can use insects as nutrition source for the feed production and sustainable foods. The region has very little animal feed ingredient uh, production, right? There's, there's animal feed being man manufactured here, but the source, the key sources are really limited. Um, you know, so countries like Malaysia and Vietnam, they're really highly dependent on imports um, for their animal feed, right? So most of it's coming from the Americas in the form of soybeans or fish meal, right? Again, fish meal, wild caught fish off the coast of South America is the vast majority of global fish meal production. So that's all shipped across the ocean, which is not very sustainable, but it's also expensive. Um, and it's kind of crazy because you have developing countries like Vietnam with this really uh, growing agro aquaculture sector, but they have some of the highest aquaculture feed prices uh, in the world, um, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they're some of the lowest income farmers. So it, it, it really squeezes everyone and it puts these countries in a really difficult situation. You had a discussion with Martin Zaria from Nutrition Technologies, and what was the most important what you learned out of that? Oh, I learned so much mm -hmm. from this episode. I mean, I don't really have a background in, in insect farming, so I really learned a lot from Martin about the, the whole process, um, what it involves, and something that I think was especially interesting for me was why this has such huge potential, specifically in Asia. And it was really interesting to hear him talk about, you know, obviously the region 
um, growing population, real sort of increased demand for food, increased demand for protein, and how insects can help sort of improve food security and sustainability at the same time. The sustainability benefits are, are quite clear. You, you can use all types of sort of food waste sources and biomass to, to feed the insects, and then they can replace other ingredients like, like soy and fish meal in, in livestock and aquaculture diets. But seeing as the region imports so much of its animal feed, locally produced insect, um, insect meal and insect protein can really help the region achieve better food security and sustainability at the same time, which is great. So, Fazi, in episode three, you had the chance to speak to José Villalón from Nutrico. It was uh, basically the, um, you know, we have so much to do, our generation, to, um, to try to curb biodiversity loss and climate change and, and, and yeah, uh, uh, those, those topics that are really difficult to address or to resolve. So this is not something that's going to be done in one or two years. And companies mm -hmm. like Nutreco have an important role to play in it. So um, I said, you know, it's, it's fine when we're dealing with adult issues in adult ways, but wouldn't it, shouldn't we start to influence that younger generation that's coming? And maybe when, by the time they're my age or our age, it's, uh, they're going to be more well prepared to make the right choices. And, um, and, and hopefully the problems won't be as seemingly unsurmountable as we see them today. And he wrote a book, it's called Gabi and Saji Go for the Salmon Seafood. What did you learn when you talked about him, about his book? I, I learned a lot from Jose. This was a really fascinating lockdown project of Jose Fialon's, um, where he wrote a book for aimed at children about how to make sort of good choices around buying sustainable seafood. And one of the first questions I had for him was, why? Why write a book for children on this issue? It's normally something that we think of as quite complicated, a, a problem that, you know, that the professionals have to be sorting out. Um, but his perspective here that it's really important that we educate children on this because this is their future. Um, and we are doing our best to solve all of these problems today. But ultimately, it's today's children that will grow up to, to really see the impact of this. So educating and engaging younger people on these types of issues um, with the hope that they'll bring some fresh energy and a new vision to solving them, I think is a really, really interesting approach to engaging people on sustainability. I think it's an excellent example of how your ideas can act in something beautiful because it's, I think it's not only for the children because also the parents maybe read it for the children so it has a whole effect on the family and I personally, I, I looked at Amazon and I would definitely buy it for some children I know and yeah, to keep on the education on sustainable seafood. Yeah, yeah absolutely. This is something that Jose mentions in, in the conversation. There's actually a section at the back of the book that's specifically for parents who might be reading it with their children to educate them as well on, on how they can make better choices. And I think this brings us really nicely to, to episode two of the podcast, actually, I think there are some really, really interesting learnings from Walter, one of the founders of Innovo, on, on sort of recommendations for young people who want to make a difference and make a positive impact in the industry as well. So Fazi, we are almost at the end and now we're speaking about episode number two, where you and Walter von Innovo spoke about gendering the egg and preventing killing the old chicks. If you're relatively young and you want to start a business, just do it, right? Don't. Don't think you need another 30 years to do it. I think there's plenty of problems in the world that need solving. And when I was a little kid, I always thought like, oh, there's, there's many people that control the world and they think about this stuff and whatever. It's really not the case, right? So, so I have been in the situation where um, looking at the chick calling problem, at some point we were almost the only ones in the world that knew about it, cared about it, worked on it, and were sort of the problem owners. I, I think there's many of these issues that are waiting for someone to take up the issue and actually solve it. Uh, and then if I look back, yeah, we took risk. Yes, it was hard work, but it's so much fun to be doing this, right? So 
uh, it's it's something that people look at it and, and go like, oh, there's a mountain to climb. Yeah, that's true. But then again, I think the view is pretty good from up here, right? That's 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 also the case. So it's I would urge people to to be a bit a bit less risk averse and just uh, go out, pick a problem, and and, and see it's it's your own and, and solve it. What was the most impression and the most inspiring outcome what you got from the podcast episode from Walter and you? I think for me, it was actually Walter's personal story um, of how he discovered this, this challenge in the poultry industry and the steps he took to start developing a solution. It was really, really fascinating for me that Walter did not come necessarily from the poultry industry. Uh, he was a student um, looking for a problem to solve. So I think starting with, with the problem and working backwards was a really, really interesting approach. And I loved his advice that he gave at the end of the episode for young people who want to have a positive impact in their career to not think too much about it, not to assume that there's somebody out there already doing it better or, or whatever it might be, to really, if you, if you found a problem that you want to solve, just go for it. And I think it was really, really inspiring advice. And I mean, it certainly put me in a good mood for the rest of the day after we had this conversation. So I, I think it's something useful for, for everyone to, to remember if this is the kind of work that they want to do. I think this is a perfect ending to stay motivated and just follow the goals and just go for it. And Fazi, we are almost at the end. Do we would like to say something from your personal or also give an outlook of what will be the next episodes and how we are proceeding with the podcast? Sure. Yeah. I mean, this has been so much fun for me. So uh, a huge thank you to, to all of our guests that have contributed on, on all of our episodes. Uh, a huge thank you to our production team as well. And of course, our, our listeners. And we're really very open to feedback. We'd love to hear your ideas on other topics, other speakers to have on the podcast. And in terms of what's coming next, we've got a few ideas in the pipeline. Something that I personally am quite excited about is thinking about measurement tools. You know, we've talked about a huge range of sustainability issues so far on the podcast. But what we haven't covered yet is how do we know that we're making progress What are the tools that we use to make sure we're moving in the right direction and having a genuine improvement on sustainability impacts? So that's something we'll cover in the future. That sounds great. I'm excited about it. And I'm so happy to have the chance today to speak with you, to be also guest in this regard of the podcast. And that's all from my side. Yeah, it was really fun. So thanks, Michelle. Thank thanks, so everybody. Much. And we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Goodbye. This is the end of the Sciencing Podcast. And if you would like to know more about avonic animal nutrition, visit www.animal-nutrition.avonic.com. The Sciencing Podcast, a production of avonic animal nutrition. Avonic, leading beyond chemistry.